We now invite our speaker, Brother Alan Eggington from Aberystwyth, to speak to us on identifying the real devil. My dear brethren and sisters and young people and friends, in our Bibles we read of the continual conflict between good and evil. It's described there as a warfare uh, and it's a battle that will be only won when evil is finally overcome. And sin is the source of all evil and that as we know was the result of Adam and Eve's transgression of God's law. Mortality, death was the end result. But God in his mercy didn't leave mankind without a hope. God promised right in the beginning a saviour and that saviour is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the day is coming, it's very near isn't it, when there's going to be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying, when God's going to wipe away all tears from all eyes and there's going to be no more death. And that we believe in a nutshell is the purpose of God. It's the, the wonderful hope that's revealed in the Bible. And all those who will listen and will obey have been invited to share in this time when the earth is going to be a place of righteousness and of peace. And of course we live today in, in a world that's the very opposite. It's a place of unrighteousness. It's a place of evil. It's a world that lieth in wickedness. And we see the nations are making preparation for war, as the prophet Joel foretold. And tonight, or today I should say, we want to consider the Bible's teaching concerning evil. Where does it come from? Is there in fact a powerful, supernatural being called the devil. That's what so many people believe. Or is, as the Bible teaches, the real devil within each one of us? Does evil come from within, from the nature that we inherit because of the transgression of Adam and Eve? Perhaps more importantly, how do we overcome this force of evil called by so many the devil? Well, the Orthodox religions nearly all believe in this supernatural devil, don't they? The traditional views of the devil speak of this super, almighty, or powerful opponent of Almighty God. One who's the author of evil, one that wages war continually against God and against mankind. In fact, if you look in a dictionary, the dictionary will say something like this. The devil in Christian and Jewish belief is the supreme spirit of evil. We find this supreme spirit of evil is taught in all the major world religions. And indeed, if we have a look at uh, Christianity, we find that, Christi that Christians, uh, the devil is sp regarded as being a, a, a fallen angel, one who rebelled against Almighty God and has been condemned to the grave, to hell. He's the enemy of mankind, the source of all evil, and in opposition to God. And if you look at the, the Islamic religion, you'll find in Islam, the devil is referred to as Iblis, uh, and that's the, the Arabic for Lucifer. And according to the Quran, God created the devil out of smokeless fire, while he created man out of clay. According to the verses of the Quran, the devil's mission until the resurrection day is to deceive mankind. And after that, they teach, he will be put into the fires of hell along with those whom he's deceived. Well, if you look at the Hindus, uh, in contrast, Hinduism does not recognise any single evil force or entity such as the devil. But Hindus recognise different beings that can perform evil acts and cause suffering. One of their prominent devils uh, is Rahu. 
His, his characteristics are similar to those of the devil. If you look at the Buddhists, a devil-like figure in Buddhism is Mara. He's a tempter, trying to distract humans from living a spiritual life by making ordinary things seem alluring and the negative to seem positive. Another interpretation taught by Buddhism is that Mara is the desires of our mind that prevent us from seeing the truth. So Mara is not an independent being, but part of one's own being that has to be defeated. And surprisingly, isn't it? It is the Buddhists that come close to Bible teaching. Desires that are present in one's own mind. A part of one's own being that has to be defeated. There's no evidence in the Bible to suggest that God created an evil being. In fact, perhaps we could have a look at a couple of references in the book of Isaiah. And you'll also find the same teaching in Job, in Ecclesiastes, in Deuteronomy. They've all got passages where God is spoken of as the creator of both good and evil. Let's have a look at Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45 and verse 7, God says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And again, we won't turn to it, but Amos chapter 3 and verse 6 says, Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? In the Hebrew Bible, the word Satan simply means an opponent or an adversary. In the Greek New Testament, it's got a very similar meaning. Again, it means adversary, accuser or liar. And in both the Old and the New Testaments, these words are used to describe ordinary people. We can all experience false accusation. We can all experience slanders. We can all experience liars from those people who are our opponents or, or our adversaries. And so these words describe the actions of those who practice evil against us. They're not the name of a supernatural, uh, an all-powerful being. They, they describe the sinful actions of those who oppose the ways of God. And so the word devil is really a personification of sin. It is not the name of an actual being. And wherever sin is practised, the works of the devil are seen. Sin is man's greatest enemy, and it comes from within. But sin finds expression in many different guises, in many different ways. It can be manifested through a person, it can be manifested in an institution and it can be seen in the evil world around us. Uh, and then we find the word devils also in our Bibles, don't we? Uh, the word in the plural. Uh, and that we find is used in the Old Testament on only four occasions. Uh, and it's used there just to describe idols. Israel turned from God to worship false idols. Uh, and that's just what the word devil is used for. In the Old Testament. The word devil in the singular only occurs in the New Testament uh, and it's translated from the word diabolos uh, and that's translated also as false accuser. It means the, the, a slanderer and when we consider how it's used you know it's, it's apparent isn't it? It cannot be speaking of the devil of popular belief. Let's have a look at John chapter 6 and verse 17. You know, it's used to describe people, not a supernatural being. John 6 verse 17. Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Judas was the devil among the twelve apostles. 
He was the one that betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, Judas was a person, but he falsely accused. He betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, and thus he was a, a devil, a, a false accuser. Let's have another look at another example, Matthew chapter 16. Here's another example of a person being Satan. It's a well-known one, Matthew 16, verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Peter was a Satan unto Christ. He was being an adversary by opposing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as he went to suffer and to die for the salvation of others. Now, the New Testament also uses another word to speak of devils. It's the Greek word diamonium. Uh, and it's speaking of malignant spirit influences. It's used when it speaks of casting out devils. Uh, and this is due to the superstition of the times. That they attributed disease to man malignant spirit influences. Uh, and so really all it's doing is describing disease. Uh, and the Bible is merely accommodating the language, the vernacular of the times. Uh, they the Bible doesn't endorse it, it merely uses that language. To cast out devils is simply to cure disease. Now, today, of course, the word devil has become part of our everyday speech. Uh, 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 and here are just a few phrases that, that are in, co in common uses in, in the world today. We say to people, go on, be a devil, when we want to encourage a hesitant person to some act of daring. When people are caught in a dilemma, we, we use the expression, they're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. You know, William Shakespeare in The Merchant of Venice wrote, the devil can quote scripture for his purpose. Uh, and the meaning was, those with unworthy motives would use deceitful words to conceal their purpose. Another proverb says, the devil finds work for idle hands to do. In other words, those who are idle are liable to cause or to get into trouble. When, when a person is successful or when a person experiences good fortune um, and it comes to those who least deserve it, we say the devil looks after his own. Uh, we also say, look, people have a, a devil may care attitude. And we mean, that, we mean by that that they're, they're reckless, don't we? Another expression we hear is, the devil is in the detail. And what we're really saying is, the details of a matter are, are, are its most problematic aspects. Uh, when we get into serious trouble, we, we, we say there will be the devil to pay. And when someone or something with a bad reputation ha has some redeeming features, we say, give the devil his due. And so, you know, it, it's in our language, isn't it? This, the, this ex these expressions concerning the devil. When someone appears, w when we're talking about them, when they suddenly come into the room, maybe, uh, we, we say, oh, speak or talk of the devil. They've just come into the room. The devil also is referred to as Old Nick. He's been referred to as the Prince of Darkness. And so we can see the word devil has been absorbed into our everyday speech. Uh, and we use words derived from the word devil. You, you know, you might play golf, or some of us will play golf, uh, and you've heard the expression of a bogey. Uh, and that's when a player is, is one stroke over par. But that word bogey, again, originates from the word devil. A bogey can also uh, be a, an evil or a mischievous spirit. It, it can cause fear or alarm. We speak, uh, or in the past, they've spoken of the, the bogey of recession. 
But despite the common use of the word devil, then mankind's failed to identify who or what the devil is. The enemy comes from within. We've all got a nature that is evil continually. But this failure to correctly identify the devil has got a fatal consequence. We're told in scripture the wages of sin are death and by our very natures we're all the servants of sin. Sin's servants earn sin's wages. They're on the devil's payroll, so to speak. And I'm sure all of us, at the end of the week, the end of the month, whatever it is, we look forward to our pay packets. But I've never found anyone that's looking forward to the wages of sin. It is probably true to say it's one of the only pay packets that no one wants to collect. If you go to, with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Again, a very well-known passage. Well, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. Sin's wages are death. We couldn't be clearer than that. The Bible teaches that the devil has got the power of death. The two are related. If sin brings forth death, and the devil has got the power of death, then sin and the devil must be synonymous. They both bring forth death, and the Lord Jesus Christ came that he might destroy the works of the devil. I'd like you to come to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. 1 John 3 verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, here's a question. How could an all-powerful, supernatural being be destroyed by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ? Surely that would have been a great victory. And this then is the very reason why it was necessary for Christ to be of our nature. For him to overcome our nature. For him to be sinless. And in his death, he destroyed that which had the power of death, which is the devil. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. It makes it very plain. Hebrews 2 and verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise himself took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. The very reason that Jesus took part or partook of our nature was that he might destroy the devil. That being the case, we would expect the Bible to teach very clearly that the devil speaks of the evil tendencies or the sinfulness of our nature. And indeed, this is what we find. We're going to look at a few parallel Bible expressions to show that sin that dwells within each one of us although it's been manifested in many different ways, is in fact the Bible devil. The real devil resides within us. I don't think we'll turn these up, but I'll, I'll give you the quotations. First of all, we read in Hebrews 9 and verse 26, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And I would suggest that that is parallel with Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, which says that through death he might destroy the devil. Here's another one. Acts chapter 5 and verse 4. Why hast thou conceived this in thine heart? 
And I would suggest a parallel to that is in Acts chapter 5 and verse 3, why hath Satan filled thine heart? Another one. We read in James chapter 1 and verse 15, sin bringeth forth death. And the parallel is Hebrews 2 and verse 14 again, the devil hath the power of death. A final one, the desires of the flesh and of the mind from Ephesians 2 and verse 3 is parallel with Ephesians 2 verse 2, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And so we've got this link, haven't we, this parallel that shows that sin and the devil are really parallel expressions. Now James shows us the link between sin and death, and indeed it's a process. If you come with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and at verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But note, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So there again is our parallel, isn't it? Sin brings forth death. The devil has the power of death. Sin arises in man's own lust. It comes from within. He's tempted. He's drawn away. He's enticed. Lust conceives. It brings forth sin. And when it's finished, it brings forth death. The real devil comes from within. We're not inherently good. We're not the innocent victims of a supernatural creature called the devil. In fact, uh, we won't go back, but uh, Genesis 8 and verse 21 says this, the imagination of a man's heart is evil from his youth. Our hearts are evil from our youth. Our own lusts, when we allow them to be satisfied, contrary to the law of God, bring forth sin and when we understand the bible teaching concerning sin concerning evil concerning the devil then we surely must recognize the false accuser the slanderer the enemy of mankind because we've acknowledged have we not that evil that's the evil that lives in each one of us that's in our own hearts and in our minds when it finds expression. Now the Lord Jesus Christ gives us confirmation that evil comes from within. He teaches this, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies, these are the things that defile a man. Now we know now, or we've got some idea now, where the adversary, the false accuser of mankind dwells. It's not something external, it's not an all, almighty supernatural being, it's something from within us. So the point is, how are we going to overcome? How are we going to uh, change uh, our evil thoughts and actions? Well, we need to understand exactly how the enemy thinks. You know, the, the Apostle Paul wrote in, in Romans 8 and verse 7, the thinking of the flesh is enmity against God. Flesh thinking, it's our, our natural way of thinking, isn't it? It's enmity against God. So I'd like you to come back with me to the very beginning, to Genesis chapter 3. Just very briefly to consider the mind or the thinking of the serpent. And in Genesis 3 and verse 1 we read, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. So first of all, 
the serpent was a beast of the field with animal thinking it was a beast it thought like the animals its thoughts were governed by its natural desires and yet it was different from the other animals because it had got the power of speech it could express its thoughts but nevertheless its mind was governed by animal tendencies and animal inclinations secondly uh, the mind of the serpent was an intellectual mind in so much that it could reason and it, and it could understand but its mind was different its mind was limited in comparison to that of the woman it was just like all the other creatures it was an animal of mere sensation its five senses provided the information upon which its animal mind reasoned and you'll find all this in Elpis Israel if you want to look at it in more detail its five senses would limit its thinking to those things which it experienced what it could taste what it could see what it could touch what it what it could what what it could uh, smell and what it could hear that, that's the five senses isn't it uh, and the, the five senses have got a law uh, and the law of the five senses is this they always react favorably to that which are, is agreeable to them if something looks good agreeable reaction if it smells good agreeable reaction tastes good good reaction feels good good reaction sounds good favorable reaction all our senses will react positively to those things which please them we all react favorably to those things that please our senses but you know the mind of the woman was of a much higher order uh, it was superior to that of the serpent because she was able to experience emotions she got what what brother Thomas calls mental feelings or sentiments she was able to discern between right and wrong she could experience thoughts emotions mental feelings uh, and these were things to which the mind of the serpent it couldn't experience them it couldn't rise to them uh, and that's a great difference between animals and humans and if we say well what mental feelings do we have that animals cannot experience you know there's many emotions there's many sentiments mental feelings thoughts that the animal mind cannot experience let's think of a few examples can the animals experience love joy peace are they long-suffering can they have faith can they experience wonder can they have hope can they be conscientious do they express anger uh, and the list goes on that there's many other things beside that we can experience and the animals don't and because the mind of the woman had these mental feelings she is what's described in scripture as a moral creature uh, and by that we, we simply mean that she got the ability to discern between right and wrong and the animals don't have that so that although just like the animals her senses would react favorably uh, and they would inform her when something was good to eat when it when it looked good when it smelt delicious and although the serpent said look it, it, it's good for food and her ears would react to that and she took hold of it and well it felt good to the touch and although all her five senses had reacted favorably she was a moral creature she had the ability to discern between right and wrong she had the power to overrule her senses and because the woman was this moral creature she got the ability to discern between right and wrong but she didn't exercise it did she in the serpent it was only the senses that were at work so what happened in the transgression well it was this Eve allowed 
animal thinking to rule over her and not the thinking of God. She obeyed the thinking of the serpent, although she could have uh, and she had the ability and the power to overrule its thinking, she could simply have said, God said, do not eat of the tree. She had the power to discern between right and wrong, but she didn't. And the sad result was that the animal thinking of the serpent became a law in her members. She and all mankind were made subject to sin. And so commenced at the very beginning the conflict between good and evil. Genesis 3 verse 15 tells us, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. That's a conflict. That's the warfare that's been going on since the foundation of the world. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. A conflict between the thinking of the fleshly animal mind of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Those who seek to follow the law of Almighty God. Those whose minds rise above mere sensation above animal thinking and aspire to develop in them the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'd like to summarise our remarks very briefly about what the Bible teaches concerning the power of evil, the devil of the Bible. We've seen the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ over sin and death, that in his death he put to death that which has the power of death, even the devil that it is sin that has the power of death it's sin that brings forth death but in the lord jesus christ we've got life sin's wages are death nobody wants sin's wages the gift of god is eternal life through the lord jesus christ we live in a world that's governed by sin the devil so to speak is in control animal fleshly thinking is the basis upon which the world is governed and so the bible tells us the world lieth in wickedness it's in the grip of the evil one we're told all that's in the world is the lust of the eye the lust of the flesh and the pride of life these things are not of god they're of the world and the world is passing away and so we're told quite clearly that to be a friend of the world is to be the enemy of God the world's thinking is that of the serpent and so we can see that you know identifying the devil is vital I think the word vital actually got the idea of being life-giving if we want to overcome evil it's the greatest contest, isn't it? It's got the richest prize. You know, nothing can be compared with the hope of the Bible. Men strive for supremacy in all walks of life. And yet it's a hollow victory, isn't it? When they achieve their goals, they're all corruptible crowns. They're all going to receive the wages of sin. We're all of the dust and we all turn to dust again. But if we fight a different warfare, if we fight in a warfare of faith, if we follow the example of Paul, even as he followed the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we can have confidence, as Paul did, that henceforth for us is laid up a crown of righteousness. There's no greater purpose to which we can put our lives, is there? no greater purpose in life and we can rejoice because the victory has been won in the lord jesus christ we've been provided with the armor for the battle we've been told to take unto you the whole armor of god and why do we do it that you might withstand the wiles of the devil we've got the armor we've got the weapons We've got the captain of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and he's put to death that which has the power of death, the devil. The sin that brings forth death was overcome in the sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we leave you with this invitation. The invitation is there for all of us that we might put on the Lord Jesus Christ and that through his perfect sacrifice our sins might be forgiven. But of course the day is near, the time is short when the Lord Jesus Christ will return. And so now we know who the real devil is, we've got to put him to death and we do so in the waters of baptism and we rise to a, a newness of life. We're no longer servants of sin, but we've become servants of righteousness through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us identify who the real devil is. about the coming week, subjects of the will of God. On Thursday at 8pm, Brother Paul Ensor from West Bromwich will speak at the Bible class and then heading off, Yes, am I with you in the Spirit? And next Sunday we have another lecture where Brother Dennis Redshaw is to speak on Adult Baptism Essential for Salvation. Brother Rod Hale will conclude the meeting in prayer after his son hymn 172, Thy way, not mine, O Lord, however dark it be, him 1-7.